I'm Nick Forster. You're listening to E-Town. John Craigie is going to be back later to play some more music, uh, along with his band. And coming up, Joby Riccio is here, Colorado native, award-winning songwriter. She's got a new album out. She's going to be out soon. Uh, right now, I mentioned that President Johnson signed legislation that created the NEA and the NEH. Big stuff and timely because um, it was also when civil rights legislation was happening, voting rights, uh, soon after that, environmental uh, protection agency was launched and others. And it was a time when I guess we all imagined that we could treat each other better and look out into the future and that um, we could support the kind of ideals that would allow us as Americans to prosper and flourish. And it sounds like it is sort of common sense and normal, but it's not uh, necessarily what's happening right now. So um, those very agencies are threatened. Laws rolled back, rules weakened, the whole idea of government questioned. Um, so it's, it's a wacky time. And the obvious is no longer obvious. But in the midst of all that, we are still uh, a nation of interesting stories and um, language and expression, and uh, including our own native communities, all kinds of diversity that we can, can uh, embrace and um, acknowledge as part of what makes us uh, united as a nation. So our next guest, uh, I was talking about the NEH, our next guest is the chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities, whose job it is to celebrate, discover, and support those stories, those cultures. Shelley Lowe, born and raised on the Navajo Nation in Arizona. She's had leadership roles at Harvard and Yale and with the American Indian Studies Program at the University of Arizona. Um, and she's now got a big job at the NEH, and we're happy that she's here. Please welcome to E-Town, the director of the National Endowment for Humanities, Shelley Lowe. Welcome, Shelley. Thank you, thank you. So glad this worked out because this morning we had a different plan and then we figured, <laughs> figured out that you were in town. You know, I was pretty impressed. I walked in and I, I got this, you know, uh, program for tonight and there I was already. And we just kind of confirmed this this morning and I was yeah. like, can they work quick? Yeah, we, we're, uh, we're nothing if not paying attention and opportunistic. But, Excellent. Um, <laughs> Um, a little background. You, I mentioned you grew up on the Navajo Nation. Maybe you could just tell us a little bit about the community that was your home. Okay, you. excellent. Well, yat e she e shali lo yin ishe belagana nishle na nesteja tachini bashishin belagana dasha che do traba dasha nala lo kantiel do nasha a do Washington deshagan. My name is Shelley Lowe. I grew up in Ganado, Arizona, on the Navajo Reservation. I now live and work in Washington, D.C. It's a very interesting place, a lot going on right now, you know? <laughs> um, I grew up in a very small rural community, um, very close-knit family. I was surrounded by cousins, aunties, uncles, grandparents. Everybody that I knew um, had lived there for many years, both my parents on both sides of my family, my parents, my aunts and uncles, all graduated from the same school that I did, right? So it was one of those communities where it didn't matter what I did, somebody knew and somebody told my grandparents. <laughs> so yeah. I couldn't do anything. Everybody knew who I was, but it was beautiful. Um, it was rural though, it was small and it, it didn't give me a whole lot of sense about you know, what the United States was. Um, I grew up in Arizona, but I didn't know that really because everything that we, the news that we got, the newspapers, our radio station, where we did our shopping was in New Mexico. So we never got Arizona TV or anything. And going into Arizona, I was like, what is this place? I don't know anything about it. Was your world bilingual? Were you? Were, yes. Yeah. So uh, I was too? Uh, not so much in school. I was not taught to speak Navajo. So I'm a lifelong Navajo language learner. And that was a choice by my parents, right? Because I, you know, the, the mentality was you need to learn English and you need to learn to speak English really well. And that is the best way for us to give you the tools that you will need to succeed. Mm -hmm. So I was encouraged to be as good in English as possible. Which and you, were, you must have been a good student. I was a good student. And you went to college. You got a couple part. of degrees. You did the all the things. Part. Yeah, for the most part. I did the right things, right? And not in the right order sometimes and didn't follow a path. I think that I tell everybody, don't do it the way I did. Um, but, you know, it was a great upbringing and it really has prepared me to do this job, I yeah. have to say. You're the first Native American to lead the NEH. Yes, very first. Yeah. Second woman. <laughs> and this is... This is um, 
Um, obviously a dumb question, but ha perhaps you could uh, delineate a little bit of the difference between NEH and NEA in terms of disciplines and what you support. Correct. So NEH, National Endowment for the Humanities, and NEA, National Endowment for the Arts, as you heard, were created together in 1965. One of the easiest way, I have a colleague who says NEA is the production of art. It's the making of the art. Everything that you do to make the art, that's NEA. All this stuff to talk about the art, that's NEH. And assess the art and make sense of the art, that's NEH. That's cool. I like that. Exp I like that. Um, and so in your role, do you travel around all over the place? I have the most fabulous job. So and I tell everybody, if you have the opportunity to do this job, please do it because it's amazing. I have had the opportunity to travel all across the country. Um, last year, I think I did 24 states, um, one jurisdiction, two jurisdictions if you count D.C., right? Um, I get to go into communities and see what's happening on the ground. I get to see museums, libraries, community centers, historic sites. It's been one of the most wonderful parts of the job, and it has shown me that America is so great. We are such a beautiful country, and we have such great stories. It's been really great. We don't need to make it great again. We don't need to make it great again. <laughs> we are great. <laughs> So uh, those stories, those stories reveal um, uh, so many things that most people don't get to see. So do you feel like that's your job at the NEH is to elevate, raise those stories and and share them in our, in order to create a sense of connection and um, discovery, or, or or what do you? How do you describe it? So I think you know one part of my job is one to get people to understand what NEH is, what we do. So I travel all over the place. Lots of people don't know who we are. Lots of people don't know what we do. Lots of people don't know how to define humanities, right? I bet every single one of you listening can say, I know exactly how to define humanities. Then I want you to come tell me because I can't do that very well in ways that people understand. So I have to go out and I have to really be clear and try to say this is what humanities is, this is what we do at NEH. The second part of that is saying, we are such a wonderful country, we have such great stories, we have so many beautiful things happening, here's what's going on, but encouraging you also to tell those stories because it's one thing for us to tell the stories, but the stories come from the communities and the communities are the best people to tell those stories and to really share that beauty. Yeah, that's cool. And I know musicians get to travel a lot and get mm -hmm. to connect with those um, aspects of, of small town America and, and uh, different, different sort of ethnic groups and so on. But it's cool that there is an organization whose purpose is to do that. You know, in case you've just tuned in, you're listening to E-Town. I'm here with uh, Shelley Lowe, who's the first Native American director of the National Endowment for Humanities. Um, I know one of the initiatives you're working on has to do with climate change and climate resilience. And that's probably more than just for the libraries and culture centers and, and resource and collections that, that are out there, but uh, about the greater challenges of, of climate chaos. Yeah, so the agency has been doing work in this area for a number of years. We have some grants that are specific for, um, they're small grants, and so when there are disasters in certain areas, organizations have the opportunity to apply to NEH for small funding. And these are sometimes to save collections or to help um, restore collections that have been damaged, or sometimes it's buildings that um, part of collection areas that need to have some work done. We have the ability to give small grants to those institutions. But we've been thinking more broadly about what does it mean to use the humanities, the tools of the humanities, and the lens of humanities to really think about um, what's happening with our change in incline climate, our changing environment, how do we start to mitigate institutions, organizations, but how do we also start to prepare and say, you know, what are we looking at in the next 50 years? What are our resources, our cultural heritage that we need to be thinking about? And how do we need to think about preserving that heritage in the next 50 years. And it could be archives, it could be libraries, but it could be stories, it could be knowledge that individuals share that need to be captured and need to be um, put into either audio files or need to be written down or need to be recorded so that we can have that knowledge in the future. But why is that accelerated by climate change? What does that mean? That's kind of what you do all the time anyway. Right, and it wasn't just climate change, right? We saw this over COVID-19. There were so many individuals who passed away that had knowledge in communities that weren't, we weren't 
weren't able to capture yeah. that knowledge before they were gone. It's about making sure that we are able to capture that cultural heritage, that cultural knowledge, one, to identify where it is, but then to also say we need to capture this, we need to save it, we need to preserve it in some way. Yeah. And what's a great story about something, some story you, you uh, feel really good about that's um, you've been able to elevate and share that's kind of reminded a broader audience about um, the, the diversity of our connections? I think, you know, well, maybe I have to say there's going to be a strange little story here. One of my examples about talking about humanities was to say it's one thing to to learn, right? Somebody tells you something and you're like, oh, that's cool. It's another thing to experience it and then to understand it yourself, like to come to understand that Norwegians are shy. <laughs> I didn't know that, right? I learned that today. Have I experienced it yet? No. Would I like to? Yes. Um, but there, there's another story that I kind of learned. It, it, there are different things that happen along the way that you just aren't prepared for. I um, actually heard a little bit of a story about how the banana slugs came to be, mm -hmm. you know, the mascot for this California school. I also learned that Californians are very good about validating your feelings. <laughs> but <laughs> it was. I think a... we're responsible for telling those stories, <laughs> not the NEH, just, just to be well, clear. You know, every day is something, you're learning something yeah. new. And I, I actually, you know, I have to acknowledge here a little bit, Dr. Patricia Limerick, she was on the National Humanities Council yeah. with me. Um, she's here in the audience with me, but she talked about how the Madonna Slug mascot came to be. And so at some point you'll have to have her back, she can tell that story. Okay. But you know, these things tied in all of a sudden today and I was like, this is weird, what's going on? Um, but you know, we see these things all the time because yeah. we have the opportunities to share our stories. And it's about listening. It's about being open, it's about listening. Um, I wanna mention just a couple things. One is that it wasn't long ago that the White House recommended zeroing out the budget for the National Endowment for the Humanities and eliminating the organization. Yeah. And uh, I suspect that'll happen again. And so are you kind of prepared for that? Because right now you're running a sizable organization with uh, a lot of employees and substantial budget and a big impact. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you prepare for that? We're actually, we're classified as a small agency. Yeah. Small but mighty, small but mighty. You know, one of the things that we do, we have a really great supporters in Congress. And part of ensuring that everybody knows kind of the impacts that we do is talking to our congressional members. So I've had the opportunity when I travel sometimes to be with congressional members and to be on the ground in their states and in their districts and to see firsthand and to share with them some of the funding that we have provided in their states and in their jurisdictions so that they have a good sense of, wow, this is what the agency has been doing and this is the kind of impact that it is having on the ground in our communities. So we continue to do that and make sure that we're trying to tell a better story. I mean. We're, you know, we're a small but mighty agency. Um, super we, small in super comparison small. to, um, <laughs> as a percentage of the federal budget. Super small. Um, but we are... 0.003% exactly. of the federal budget. Yeah. Super small. We're small. <laughs> <laughs> but we're mighty. Mighty, yeah. Um, you know, we... we we're committed. I have to say I have some of the best staff ever. They are some of the smartest people in the country. They are so committed to the work that they do. They have the most interesting knowledge that I've ever come across in the most interesting areas. So you could ask an NEH staffer a random question. Somebody knows the answer to that and can give you a breakdown of that answer. Um, the, you know, they're so interested and they're so committed and they know the value of the work that we do. We just got to make sure we're telling that story and telling yeah. it loud. We're going to try to help a little. If people want to know more and they want to find out, is there a website they can go to? And well, you can go to NEH.gov. But what I always recommend is, you know, we, we have funding nationally that we give out as a competitive basis. But... 40% of our program funds go straight into our state and jurisdictional humanities council. So if you have not connected to your state humanities council, please do so because they are doing work on the ground. They're doing discussion sections. They're doing programming. They're doing um, things that are really important to what's happening in the communities. There are always ways to get involved with your state humanities council. And I encourage you to sign up on their listservs, get their publications, follow their social media, and then just attend some of the events that they're doing. Every state has one? Every state has one. Every jurisdiction. The Humanities Council. Humanities Council. I didn't know. Yes. So get involved. Yeah. Okay. Get them on the show. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I'm happy to learn more. I appreciate the work you're doing, and I appreciate the fact that you're 
um, connecting the dots among what are ultimately these disparate communities, disparate storytellers, disparate histories. But you're finding that commonality, that common ground and celebrating it. I yes. appreciate that. We have such great stories. Tell your stories. Yeah. Write them down. Share them. Okay. Please. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Shelley Lowe, Chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Thank you, Shelley. <laughs>